Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Mala Dumim in Israel. The human mind is a ladder reaching to the stars and also a bottomless pit. That much is clear to anybody who has attempted to plumb to the depths of their own mind. We can span the universe with a mere flick of thought, and we can crawl into a hole from which it is near impossible to be extricated. This enormous range of power is ours to use however we wish or so we like to believe. We also know that it is not a simple matter to direct the mind in whatever manner we choose. Even though it is truly ours, it is somehow frequently out of our control. Anyone who doesn't believe this has only to examine their own reaction when something irresistible is placed in their path that they would prefer to not partake of. It is always possible to resist, but we all know that it is all too often anything but easy. Sometimes it is downright impossible, and we just move in recklessly, knowing the entire time that this is not in our best interest. We may even tell ourselves this very thing, but we still sense that the inevitable will happen. This is strange to us, even when we have experienced it many times. It is just the way things are. Whether the mind is more than the physical brain is something that is fascinating, but irrelevant to this matter. Regardless, that thing that does the thinking and choosing frequently has what seems to be a mind of its own, like some shopping cart that goes where it wants despite our best efforts to steer it somewhere. When it goes in a direction that is just what we need at the moment or that sets us on some beautiful path into the future, nothing could be more wonderful. Everything seems to fit together and we get the feeling that somebody or something is on our side. But when things go awry, as they sometimes do, it seems as though the universe is conspiring against us. It's not as if this is some new phenomenon that sprang up when we first gained some scientific understanding of the mind a little over 100 years ago. We now understand much more about the brain than anybody in the past, but the mind itself remains just as open or closed as it always has been. People in ancient times were intricately aware of the tricks their mind played on them. They may have attributed the powers and weaknesses of the mind to some divine force or whatever, but they knew as much as we do that these whims and powers existed. They had no medications to calm the mind down or to control its fits and fancies. They had nothing to work with other than their own internal will to steer that ship. We have all kinds of drugs to influence and harness these forces, and we rely increasingly on them to attain some sort of stability. Who knows if we are finally getting things under control or making them infinitely worse. The stories in a book as ancient and as revered as the Bible reveal some of these mind struggles, if one knows how to read them. When we read about Cain battling with some inner voice telling him that he could improve his emotional state if he just put forth the effort, but if he doesn't, he would doom himself to an evil fate, We recognize that this is precisely what we go through over the course of our lives. In this week's Parsha, there may be another of these inner struggles buried between the verses. We just have to open our eyes to see it. The Parsha is called Shemot, which means names. This is the first Parsha of the second book of the Torah, Exodus, which is known as Shemot in Hebrew. The word names has very little to do with the Parsha or with the book, but such are the whims of literature. The Parsha deals with the events that led up to the Exodus. First, it tells of the Israelites living in Egypt following their immigration there to join their brother Joseph to escape the regional famine. Then they grew exponentially in numbers to the alarm of their hosts, the Egyptians. The Pharaoh, who was not the same one who chose Joseph as his viceroy, saw the Israelites as a great threat who could upset the balance of power in Egypt. He gradually enslaved them to keep them under control. He tried to limit their population growth by killing all the newborn males. None of this worked, and the population just grew. One of these newborn males was hidden by his mother for a few months after his birth. When this was no longer a sustainable solution, she placed him in a small container to float on the Nile River for whatever fate awaited him. His sister watched from a distance as none other than the daughter of the pharaoh spotted the object while bathing in the river. She had her maids retrieve it and found an infant crying inside. She took pity on the baby and did not allow it to be put to death against her own father's decree. When the sister saw this, she said that she could take the child back to its mother to nurse and then return it after it was weaned. 
But before any of this happened, Pharaoh's daughter gave him a name. She called him Moshe, meaning in some obscure manner, drawn from the water. Moshe was thus raised in the royal house and became something of a favorite to Pharaoh. Upon reaching manhood, he went out to see for himself what was happening in the land. In some mysterious manner, he understood that he was a Hebrew, and he witnessed the Hebrews suffering under the oppression of slavery. He sensed that their oppression was connected to him and wanted to do something about it. In the course of two incidents in which he tried to intervene in their fate, he got himself into trouble and had to run away. Thus, he found himself a fugitive in the land of Midian. There he found himself a wife whose name was Zipora and had his first of many encounters with God. This first encounter was the famous scene at the burning bush. In the course of this long dialogue with God, he was told that he would be the one who would bring about the exodus of his people from Egypt. This miraculous series of events was to take place over an extended period, during which Moshe would have to first convince the Israelites of the nature and goal of this wild scheme, and then put it into action by battling with Pharaoh and the power of Egypt. Moshe attempted to refuse this appointment insisting that he was not the right man for the job and that it wouldn't succeed in any case. But God wouldn't take no for an answer, and Moshe found himself heading back to Midian to prepare for the next fateful stage of his remarkable life. He tells his father-in-law that he must return to Egypt to, quote, check on his brothers there to see if they still live, leaving out for some reason the real reason he was going back. Then he takes his wife and children with him, even though God gave him no such instructions. On the journey back, God speaks to him again, reminding him to tell Pharaoh that, quote, Israel is my son, my firstborn. After informing him that he would harden Pharaoh's heart so as to refuse to agree to letting the Israelites go. This would hardly strengthen Moshe's already half-hearted mind in, the, in his likelihood of success. Then a strange sequence appears in the text, possibly the strangest in the entire Torah. God tells him, quote, I say to you, send my son that he will serve me, and you refuse to send him, so I will kill your firstborn son. This surprising threat is immediately followed by a scene which seems to defy explanation. Quote, while they were at an inn, God met him and sought to kill him. Zipporah then took a stone knife and cut off her son's foreskin and touched it to his legs, saying, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. He released him. Then she said, a bloody bridegroom of circumcision. What are we to make of all this? Who did God want to kill at that inn? Why would God, would God want to kill anybody associated with Moshe after he had set out on the fateful journey back to Egypt? Why did Zipporah's act of circumcising her son somehow get Moshe out of this predicament? There are no simple answers to any of these questions. This sequence is considered about as bizarre as anything in the entire Torah. The standard answers assume that God's final words to Moshe, I quote, I say to you, send my son that he will serve me, and you refuse to send him, so I will kill your firstborn son, were meant for Moshe to say to Pharaoh. Thus Pharaoh was being told in advance that he would refuse and would ultimately face the threat of death of his firstborn son. But this makes the dramatic scene at the end all the more mysterious. Moshe was just doing his job, and then he finds himself, or his son, in mortal danger at the hands of none other than God. There is an answer to this. If we open our minds and realize that those words were not meant to be directed to Pharaoh as some future threat, but to Moshe himself, everything works out. Moshe had cold feet about the whole thing right from the beginning. He then strangely brought his family with him. Then God told him that he was to play his part in sending the Israelites out to serve God, but that his inner feelings meant that he was essentially refusing to go along. The threat, which was immediately carried out, was to kill Moshe's firstborn son. This is what almost happened at the inn. The circumcision fended off this threat, perhaps because it showed Sipporah's active willingness that her son be included in the fate of the Israelites. Moshe was now fully a part of the mission because his wife had sealed him in with this covenant of blood. Assuming we can accept this interpretation, we glean an insight into the inner workings of the mind of the main architect of the ex Exodus, 
the central story of the Bible. This was Moshe, the man who made it all happen, not being all there right at the beginning, despite being assured by God that it would all work according to plan. There would be hitches, but they would also be part of the plan. Moshe, despite his desire to help the Israelites in their plight, and despite his being the perfect receptacle for God's message, was only lukewarm to the whole thing. This is astounding. It was only with the imminent threat to his son and his wife's timely actions that really got him on board. Why would Moshe have such reservations at this important point in time? Why couldn't he suppress them and just get on with the task at hand? The answer, perhaps, is that even one such as Moshe, on such a mission, also had to face the whims and fancies of his own mind. He had these reservations, and he was unable to suppress them. This is the way the mind works. If there is something there buried in the morass of active and passive thoughts, it will emerge. Perhaps only God really knows what is going on inside the mind of a person. Perhaps even the person to whom those thoughts belong is largely oblivious to them. But they are there, and they will surface somehow. It is not clear what we can do about this precarious situation other than to try and work out the conflicts before they erupt. In Moshe's case, it was a dire threat to his son that forced him to confront his inner demon. The mind is deeper than any of us could possibly know. It contains thoughts of a scope that would shock us all, both of a positive and negative nature. We are the possessors of a power that is near divine, right within us. It is almost too much for a mere human being to handle. Yet that is our task nevertheless. We are each charged with the mission of using our minds to enrich our lives and to not destroy them. This is a huge task upon which our fate depends. But we, more than any power or fate in the world, hold the keys to making it work, if we so choose. Shabbat Shalom.